Hello, good evening, everybody, and welcome to our last webinar of the year. And um, we'd like to welcome people that have joined us for the first time and never been to a TNT webinar before, and also welcome uh, people that have come back for more. So it's really good to see lots of people's names uh, signed up who've been to our past webinars. And our webinar today, the last webinar of the year, is on middle leadership mastery. And we're really, really excited uh, and pleased to have our special guest, Adam Robbins, um, who you've probably read a little bit of information about when you signed up for the webinar. Um, so welcome everyone. We hope you find it useful. Um, and if you don't, then please tell us at the end, um, but hopefully you will, and you'll get some, some really good useful information out of it. Hello, everybody. Um, just a quick information about communication. So you'll see that there's a, a Q&A function. So if you've got any specific questions you'd like to ask ourselves or Adam, you can pop that in there. And if we've got time at the end, we will answer them then or we will uh, reply in the Q&A section. And also um, there's a chat function for you to, to share just to say hi and to share any ideas with uh, any of the other attendees or, or with ourselves. So please make sure you communicate with us um, in either of those formats. So we're going to hand you straight over to Adam. So he's going to be leading our session on middle leadership and mastery. So uh, thank you very much, Adam. And we really, really appreciate you giving up your time uh, to help us out with this webinar. So I'll, I'll hand straight over for you. Excellent, Avril. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, and it's great to be here. Uh, yeah, so my talk, my webinar is uh, all about the, some of the things I've learned uh, the hard way over many years. Um, I've been a head of department, head of science in my case, for about eight years. Uh, and I've been teaching, I think this is my end of my 19th year. This is definitely one I probably won't forget, if we're being honest. Um, and uh, if you have any questions that we don't get a chance to and you want to ask me something directly, you can see there's my uh, Twitter handle and things like that. Um, so if you want to get in touch, you can do. Now, uh, I wrote a book called Middle Leadership Mastery. Uh, this book took a couple of years to write and it started off as, as a blog post where I was just going to be ranting about some middle leadership training I've been on and how incredibly unhelpful it was. Um, hopefully I'm going to push an arrow here and the slides are going to move on. That is not working. Ah, there we go. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, so middle leadership is uh, really, really, really challenging. It's really, really hard. And um, I think there's a number of reasons for that. Basically, the old adage, uh, it travels both ways, is really, really true uh, for middle leaders. You have kind of contrasting bosses that you have to work for. Uh, you've got your senior leaders that you have to work for. They have their agenda and their drive for school improvement. You've got your staff, your team uh, that you're going to be leading with, and they're an incredibly important resource and you'll be highly attached to them. But then you're also accountable to the students. It's your job to be uh, responsible for maybe their pastoral development through five years of their life, or maybe their subject education development uh, for their whole journey through school. So. Middle leadership can become an incredibly hard job. And one of the things I found really interesting is a lot of people seem to think that most people do middle leadership as a step up to senior leadership. And so they treat the job like it's um, people earning their stripes. You know, if you want to get promoted, you have to do this job. And if you want to get promoted and you're doing this job, then you're going to have to do X, Y, and Z, because that's what I had to do to get here. And, uh, you know, we're going to milk as much out of you as we can. Uh, while you're here before you go on to pass this new. And I just don't think that's true. I think um, middle leadership should be like a valid uh, career progression that people choose to stay in if uh, we can make it sustainable for them and do it in the right way. Um, middle leadership's also incredibly hard because we have these three areas that we have to do on the job. So we're responsible for the strategic development of our area, our year group, our department, whatever it is, SEN. Um, we're also responsible for being teachers and we still maybe teach a lot or we still um, do a lot of on the ground work if we're working pastorally. And that's a huge thief of time. So thinking strategically and teaching are very, very different skill sets. 
And um, the worst thing is, especially if you're a subject leader, is you have to walk the walk. You have to teach as good as you can, as your best teacher. So you're leading from the front every day. If someone walks into your room and they're having a bad, you're having a bad day and things aren't going quite the way you planned, then that can be really challenging for your ego and your confidence if you're supposed to be the one that's kind of making judgments about the rest of the department's teaching. And then on top of that, you've got a huge amount of logistical issues like budget balancing, HR, recruitment. Um, one of the ones I did this week that I don't particularly do about return to work interviews, all those kind of things. And you come into all this and uh, before that, maybe you've been, um, you know, just a main scale teacher and it can be quite a large step to say the least. However, it's also what makes it incredibly, incredibly rewarding. I think there's very, very few jobs that give you the dynamic changes and variety to uh, the day-to-day -day work as it does when you're doing a middle leadership role because you have all these different hats you can wear. And while that can be uh, stressful and intimidating sometimes, it really is uh, an amazing job because you still get to teach and you get to kind of deliver stuff strategically that can help large groups of children. You can create systems that really allow your teachers to thrive and you can develop teachers. So, you know, it's really, really a sweet job if you can get to a point where you can do it sustainably. Now, most people, uh, when they get thrown into the deep end, they jump straight from being a teacher to a middle leader. And I was thinking about what kind of training I received uh, when I made that jump many, many years ago. And I was thinking, well, I had some experience, you know, I've been teaching uh, a quite a long time. I deliberately tried to avoid uh, promotion early in my career. I, I wanted to try and create a work-life balance. I saw middle leadership as very much about doing admin and getting paid a little bit more to do a lot more paperwork. Um, and to be fair, back then, that was quite a common feature of the job. Uh, we get some role models. Like uh, I was um, very fortunate that my first head of department was a man called Sean Allison, who uh, wrote uh, Making Every Lesson Count later on and um, has done quite a lot of work in the field of CPD and uh, research informed things. So I had a really good role model uh, at the start of my career that really helped me. And then you get a lot of what we call generic training. And these things tend to focus on leadership styles. Uh, there's a big, big chunk about difficult conversations because that is a useful thing uh, to work on, but there's not much about the kind of nuts and bolts about how education works, how um, things fit together, how you work with people in an effective way. So I was starting to think about what knowledge was missing. And I came up with the chapter titles essentially of the book. Uh, so the book's in nine sections, and I'll give you a second just to read them. And I thought those. Uh, sections were really useful because they try to break the job down into manageable chunks of things that aren't normally talked about. So curriculum was a huge push, obviously, uh, when I started writing this, the new Ofsted framework had just come out and lots and lots of people were talking about curriculum and they were talking about it like it was an object more than a process. And they would mention, you know, like we have inspected our curriculum and it would be very much a proper noun. Um, and it, it really wasn't in tune with some of the things I was hearing from some of the people more knowledgeable in the area than me. So I was really fortunate to work with a few people on that chapter and, and pull in some uh, areas of sociology and things like this. Teaching and learning is something that uh, has always been a big passion of mine and there's been loads done in that uh, area but for some reason middle leaders seem to mistake the idea that their job is to improve the teaching and learning that is their primary role maybe if they're a head of department we sometimes think of the logistical aspects of being more important but actually if you improve teaching and learning that's the number one thing everything else will come from there and over time it's been really nice to see a shift for, of middle leadership away from kind of being a logistical exam entries coursework deadline kind of thing uh, into a more a uh, holistic role where you're responsible for teaching and learning across your department and you can kind of uh, forge those ideas forward. Uh, assessment is absolutely crucial. And so often people treat assessment like it's this 
um, deity of information that how, you know, little Susie gets um, five out of 15 in her test and that, that tells us something. So I was really, really fortunate to work with some very, very knowledgeable uh, assessment experts. And what we've done in that chapter is we've uh, broken down how, what assessment means and what a test score really tells you and why assessment is not a process that you can do in a vacuum because every decision you make about how you assess and why you assess affects the inferences you can make. And we, and I've kind of compiled a guide to help people build assessment policies in there. Um, quality assurance is obviously a huge part of the job. Um, it's one of the main areas that seems to be focused on in a lot of policies and a lot of training. Um, teacher development lines in with the uh, teaching and learning aspects and make sure that uh, your teachers are progressing. Um, I think there, there's a lot of different schools of thought. Some people think that developing teachers is more a process of uh, kind of quality controlling them and then uh, managing them uh, if they're not up to standard, trying to find someone to replace them. Other people think that maybe you should take the teachers you have and try and get them as good as humanly possible in the time you have with them. I think it uh, very much is context dependent and ideology uh, based there, but I tend to be more on the second half. So what I've got in there is some ideas about how you can try and improve all teachers in your department without making the ones that need to improve the most feel like they're under huge amounts of pressure and scrutiny to try and take the uh, hard edge of things, I suppose. Um, decision making, we're gonna talk about that one a bit today. Um, the pastoral issues area is something that I was really uh, wanted to focus on because when I found myself in difficult pastoral situations, either with a challenge in parents or in being confronted with students uh, misbehaving in the corridor or in crisis or all these kind of things. I had literally no idea what I was doing the first time. And I realized that we have all these people that are uh, experts in these fields and they learn it all um, just by trial and error, it seems. And it doesn't seem too much of a curriculum for these kind of teaching of pastoral areas. So I've tried to put some uh, ideas together for dealing with these situations so that novice middle leaders, when they first find themselves in these unique situations that don't really happen uh, when you're a classroom teacher, uh, have a few strategies that they can try. Uh, leading others, obviously that's really huge. That's all about forming teams. We're gonna talk a little bit about that one um, uh, later on and some aspects of it. Um, and then finally, well-being. I don't think there's many people that have been a middle leader over the last 18 to two years, 18 months to two years that haven't had times where they have wondered what on earth is going on. Um, and even when the world was really normal, there were just different kinds of pressures. So uh, that chapter is quite a personal chapter for me. It, it kind of comes from a certain point in my life a few years ago when, um, you know, I was considering what I was going to do with my future and some of the ideas that helped me. Um, it was also really good because I could pull on ideas um, from uh, therapy and cognitive behavior therapy and things like this that um, I had some contact with. Now, that's a really, really long list. And um, so we're not gonna be able to focus on all of them today. Um, so I've just picked three that I thought we could talk a little bit about. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about quality assurance first, because I feel like that is something, especially for people that are new to middle leadership might be very uh, nervous about. I'm gonna talk a little bit about some aspects of decision-making and I'm gonna kind of um, plead for you to uh, not think too much of yourself and not fall for some of the common mistakes that people make. I'm gonna talk a little bit about leading others, but we're not gonna talk huge amounts about um, how to generate a team, storming, norming, performing. We're gonna talk about some of the nuts and bolts like having meetings and not hacking everyone off um, because those two things uh, tend to go hand in hand. If you get the meetings right, you can tend to build morale quite easily. So hopefully it'll be quite practical. Um, we'll generate some questions, um, but that's what we're gonna talk about today. So quality assurance, is not quality control. Quality control is something that occurs, you know, at a bakery, uh, you know, professional industrial bakery. Quality control is something that occurs at a bolt factory that has to make bolts that fit a certain hole. Um, teachers shouldn't have quality control because teaching is a dynamic profession full of hundreds of thousands of minute decisions that are made all the time by experienced professionals. 
So every class is different, every lesson is different. Uh, if you try and control that, what happens is you run a risk of losing uh, teacher autonomy and teachers end up thinking that their jobs, so they're just a vessel for the scheme of work. They just push next on the PowerPoint, read the slide out and tell the students to do the question. Um, and that is an incredibly expensive resource being wasted. So what we want to try and do is we want to, as we know leaders, we want to assume a role of quality assurance. So we want to assume that there are many ways of doing things effectively, but what are the common features that effective practice has in a certain area? Can we name them? Can we make them clear to people? And can we judge their performance and their choices they make against that criteria in a kind of transparent and open way? And unfortunately with teaching, that is incredibly hard. So what tends to happen is we focus on routines. And we focus on routines because routines are both really, really important and also really, really visible. So I can have a routine in my classroom where I gain attention by you know, doing a signal pause and assist. Maybe I have a hand signal, maybe I do a countdown, and things like that. And it can be observed by someone else. And that is really easy to do. Unfortunately, that's not learning, though. Learning is the currency that we have. Um, so what we try to do is we try to generate things that we think we can see that also are things that we think contribute to learning. And we call those things proxies. So they're things that we think when we see them happening in the classroom, we think learning is more likely to happen. Now, we run into a big problem with proxies in the fact that they are at best kind of like a correlation rather than a causation. So if I see a student answering questions, that's a proxy for what I think is going on in their head, which is kind of challenging themselves to think about the information and challenging themselves to try and remember or recall the correct information or analyze or apply a skill correctly. Now, it's really hard because you can't see what's going on in the students' heads. Um, so it makes it really, really difficult to pick the right proxies because there are a number of proxies that have been identified as being not very, very good. So before I turn on to the next slide, which shows you a list of um, proxies from Rob Coe that he uh, published, um, just have a think for a second about the kind of things you might think are in a really effective lesson. And we'll see how many crop up on this list. Okay, so you may have had a few ideas. Let's see if any are on this list. Okay, so uh, students being really busy, I used to be praised for the amount of activity I had in my classroom. Nowadays, uh, I would be concerned if that was the only thing I was looking for. It doesn't mean it's not good. It just means it may not indicate learning. So it can't be the main thing I have to look for. Motivated students are really good, obviously. Um, the disinterested students, it doesn't mean disinterested students don't learn. Um, we just go down there, classroom calm and ordered. A lot of these things are things that people look to observe. And that's not a problem because you have to look for something. The problem is when you take them as a cast iron guarantee that you have a quote unquote good teacher, you can't really infer that effectively. And what happens is if you raise the stakes of these things as a middle leader, if you say these are the things I'm looking for in my lesson, then your team hear that and they generate those things. But that's not their job. Their job is not to make the students busy. Their job is not to make sure the students have supplied some of the correct answers. Their job is to help the students learn. And learning is an incredibly complicated process and very, very, very poorly understood. And so as leaders, we need to make sure that while we may notice these things, they cannot be the only things we look for and promote. So we have to come in much more holistically when we're looking at lessons. We can't have a tick list. Problem is, a tick list is really easy to use and it generates a nice bit of data and you can shove it uh, to uh, someone that's coming in from outside and you can say, look at the difference I've made as a middle leader. You know, um, when I was going in uh, to lessons my first week, I was here, only 50% of classes were calm and ordered. And now that's up to 75%. And so look at the difference I've made. There's a real reassuring aspect to these proxies, and that's what makes them so enticing for us, but we have to try and resist. And it comes down to uh, the work of 
uh, Donald T. Campbell, okay, and he has a brilliant quote um, about this role that proxies play. So I'll just give you a second to read that. So what Campbell's basically saying is whatever proxies I prioritize in my department, they're the ones that staff will give to me. So they will either consciously or subconsciously change what they're doing to fulfill those proxies. And that might actually undermine learning. Let's take one about um, students doing lots and lots of writing. So uh, students have to do lots of writing in the lessons. All of a sudden, we're, we're doing a big push to make sure literacy is good. So the students do an extended writing, so they do it right stamina. But maybe in the lesson I have someone coming into, I was actually only going to get them to write for a couple of sentences, just a short answer. But then the head of department walks in and he's, I see him and then all of a sudden I think, oh, I could use this opportunity as an extended writing. And I switch my plan and I make the students write half a page on something instead. I change the question maybe on the fly and they do that. And so I've changed my plan to what I thought was best yesterday for my class because I'm now in a situation where I'm being observed. And so I'm gaming the system, essentially, as it's called. I am changing my behavior to fulfill the metric that I know they're looking for. And this is a really, really difficult thing to resist. But by being aware of it, we can, as leaders, try to fix it. So what I'm going to talk about is uh, how we can set up a quality assurance system that tries to prevent teachers gaming the system. OK, and it's based around uh, four C's. Oh, this issue says three. I invented a fourth one. Well, I didn't invent it. Someone on Twitter told it to me the other day, and I thought it was brilliant. So you're going to get four, hopefully. First one's clarity. OK, so clarity is everything. Uh, if you've ever done any management training, they'll say that clarity is the number one thing that all people need. Clarity of the standards that are required. And it's definitely true. In this case, the clarity is going to be um, all about what you think good teaching should entail. So what your department teaching and learning policy is, what kind of um, ethos your team has around what they think good teaching is. It's not my job to tell you what that should be, because that is quite a personal thing and different contexts need different foci. Um, you, if you want my opinion if in the book, there's a whole chapter on my opinion. That's one of the benefits, I suppose, of writing a book down is your kind of opinion becomes well known. But whatever it is, you need to make sure your entire team is ready and willing to understand the details of the kind of things you want to create happening in your classrooms. The second one is curiosity. The point of quality assurance is not to judge. The point of quality assurance is to begin a dialogue with the teacher. Because unfortunately, you weren't there five minutes before you walked in. You weren't there last night. You weren't there the lesson before. And as expert practitioners, teachers make dynamic decisions based on things that you weren't aware of. So your opinion of what they should have done and their opinion of why they did it may be different. So before you come to any kind of conclusion or make any recommendation about what to do next, it's always worth coming at things from a point of curiosity. It's also really, really good because it reduces the stakes of observation. High stake observations are always a thing that um, don't really improve performance. Uh, people are much more likely to perform if there's a kind of building of a relationship of trust where they know you're not coming in to try and uh, catch them out or anything like that. You're just there to help them. Um, so curiosity is the best way to imbue that to everyone. Culture then feeds into that. So how are you going to create an environment in your department where when you walk into the room, the teaching doesn't change? because the culture is such a place that they trust you, they know you're not gonna to jump to conclusions, they know you're there for their own benefit and they're eager to get valid feedback so they can improve. Incredibly difficult to do. I have a, a Teach First this year, so she started uh, in September and then obviously by the time like October came along, she was teaching remotely and all these things. And since schools reopened, it's very, very hard to go into her classroom and not have her change her teaching and get very, very, very nervous because she's not been used to having people in the classroom. She's been working remotely and things like this. 
Um, and so, you know, establishing that culture with her is going to take some time. And so we're going in every day, basically, just to kind of desensitize her to it. But it's a really clear apparent that when someone walks into the room, she forgets her words mid-sentence, you know, she changes her body language and things like this. Um, so establishing a culture that is all about development is really, really key, I think. If you don't and go the other way and have quality assurance all about accountability, what you'll have is as soon as you walk in the room, people will show you what you want to see. And then as soon as the door closes, they'll go back to what they were going to do anyway, partly out of spite because they, you know, you've lost them as a team. You're not doing it for their benefit. Um, and then hopefully the fourth one's going to come up. Yes. So this one I was uh, gifted to by someone else on Twitter when I was uh, talking about it the other day. And I thought it was absolutely spot on. Candor. Okay. Now, candor is used a lot as, a kind of shorthand for just being blunt with people. Um, and I don't really prescribe to that. Candor is all about addressing things that you see when you see them instead of trying to gloss over them for the person's interests. It has to be done really with warmth and appreciation and honesty. And I have screwed this up a number of times in my career. My two biggest failures as a head of department have come from the inability to be candid with someone the first time I've seen something. And I've let something progress to the point where it went from a small issue to a big issue. And then when it's dealt with, it created a large consequence. And, you know, in one case, we're talking about um, the person, you know, leaving the school and going to work at a different school. So trust me when I say you are not doing anyone any favors by trying to kind of subtly move them on if you think something needs to change uh it's your duty to talk to them uh in an honest way but nice you know there's no there's no point being a prat to people they don't need it they're doing the best job they can normally so what we're trying to establish here with quality assurance is this idea that um we can't just do a tick list uh we can't come in with a position of making a judgment instantly although you're uh, experience and your gut feeling might give you inclinations in some way and they're worth listening to because that's you know all your years of experience communicating with you they can be flawed and it is worth double checking you know what's going on um, we need to build that culture that avoids proxies uh, I've, I've just had a flashback to I think the worst proxy I ever noticed before it was a few years ago now but does anyone um, remember the, this, the um, Ofsted shake test was the rumor it was. So the idea was that someone would come and visit your classroom as part of an inspection. They would pick your book up and they would go, they would shake it, one of the student's books. And if the worksheets fell out, they weren't glued in properly or something. And the argument was that was low standards in the classroom and therefore you must have low standards in other areas. And, uh, you know, it's hard to think that it was only kind of five or six years ago that 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 culture kind of persisted through education where it was all about you know how many ticks were in the books and how neat the books were and all these kind of things but i do remember like coming into school a sunday before an inspection and like spending four hours with five glue sticks sticking in a kid's worksheet because i'd forgot to spend a lesson doing it and you just think like i spent a lesson teaching students something in my case science instead of getting them to stick worksheets in but then I had to sacrifice my own time to fulfill this pointless metric, this pointless proxy that um, just so I wouldn't get in trouble with my boss when he came into the room. And, you know, I mean, that's just messed up, let's be honest. So hopefully you're not in that kind of situation. If you are, you know, please reach out to people so uh, we can find a way to support you because I feel like education has moved on some way from that. But um, I'm aware that everyone's context is different, you know, this may not just be a UK based audience and things like that. So with call assurance, they're the things that I think are, are really, really important. The next one I said I was going to talk about uh, was going to be decisions. And I want to start by something really obvious. OK, change management is something that's talked a lot about in training sessions. OK, change management is almost 90 percent of the formal um, middle leadership training I've ever received. It's all about, you know, having your vision, getting your group, building them on. And these things are all really important. But it's hell of a lot easier to change stuff if you are making good decisions. You know, it's easy to bring people with you 
no one writes a book on on coming up with really good decisions and the change is really easy everyone talks about difficult change but if you can make better decisions then uh change becomes a lot easier for you to manage the question becomes how do we make the best decisions how do we know we're making good decisions because i remember a time a few years ago that i was it was just after christmas i was sitting um at my dining room table uh, looking at some things and I was thinking, you know, how on earth am I going to get myself out of this situation? I just had nothing. I just had no solutions popped to mind about how I was going to solve myself, this issue that had occurred. Um, and it made me realize just how often that probably does happen because you only have your own experience, really. Maybe you've only, you know, been teaching five years and all of a sudden you're in a, in a middle leadership role. Uh, maybe you've only taught in one school, you know, so you only have that context and that, that ethos. So, how do you make these stronger decisions? So I've tried to break it down into two things. I think, first of all, coming up with the right strategy is obviously really important, and it's kind of the thing we're always aiming for. But I also want to float an idea that time is a hugely limited resource, and everything we do has an opportunity cost. So when we're coming up with a strategy, we also need to decide how much we're going to commit to that strategy. How good does that strategy have to get before we accept it's a job well done and move on to the next thing because there is physically not enough time in in your working week to get everything perfect and perfectionists often find themselves really struggling with this they're obviously normally really um well suited to middle leadership but this kind of aspect the idea that things can be a little bit imperfect and still good enough is uh something that doesn't get talked about that much what basically happens is someone says it like this and then someone else says that just means you've got low standards and why do you not want more for your students and uh it's kind of like this trump card that people pull, up, pull out because they don't want to have a, a proper debate about the realities of the job so we're going to look at that in a little bit of detail as well now uh when it comes to the strategy it's all about how much you know so the more stuff you know the more different options you've got to to make this decision and so where do you get this information from is really, really hard because, you know, I spent the morning this morning talking about the uh, ECF framework with people. And one of the things that blew me away was just how detailed the curriculum they've created for these new teachers are. They've really gone broad and wide and, and talked to lots of people to figure out what things that they think all new teachers need to know. So they have this wide knowledge base and they've been able to come up with some uh, good decisions. But where can I go as a middle leader? Well. There are obviously books you can buy. I can recommend one if you want to know. Um, you could go to a lot of people blog about things. Twitter is obviously a huge resource for teachers. Uh, and if you're not on Twitter, I would encourage it because although some people will uh, complain about, uh, you know, the different sides of educational debates uh, and things like this, I've always found most people on Twitter very, very, very willing to talk about ideas and share ideas and, and talk about things in an open and honest and way. Um, and then you've got, I suppose, your local network. You know, do you, are you in a, an academy trust maybe? So you can reach out to people there, see what they're doing. Can you visit a local school? If you're new to the role as a middle leader, do you know where an excellent school is in your local area that you could maybe visit um, and things like this? But what you need to do as a middle leader is if you've got a problem, let's say, let's pick assessment. You've got a problem, you need to set up a new assessment system. Well, that means you're going to need to learn quite a lot of stuff about different types of assessment systems, their strengths and weaknesses, what you're trying to achieve. Otherwise, what you're going to do is just copy what maths do or, you know, or copy what's going on in key stage one and instead of key stage two. Um, and that may not be appropriate. So trying to gain as much knowledge as possible is probably my one tip to any kind of aspiring middle leader or new middle leader. The more stuff you know, the easier it will be for you to make the decisions you need to make. Unfortunately, our brains are not very reliable things. Uh, the human brain is basically a forgetting machine. Its main job is to try and kind of keep the amount of information that you are exposed to a second by second basis reduced. So we have a huge filtering system that's in place um, and we have a huge set of what's called cognitive biases that affect us because our working memories are not very good. Um, and so we have to kind of make choices about the way we handle information to kind of optimize. 
And I've picked out three here that I think are really, really effective ones for people in it comes to decision making. There are loads of them that, you know, cognitive biases are like hundreds, literally hundreds. Uh, but these three, I think, are ones that always affect us. The first one is called the egocentric bias. And if I was going to summarize that, I would say it's basically the older I get, the better I was. When we look back on ourselves um, and earlier in our career, maybe as a main scale teacher, we have a rose tinted view of ourselves. We do not have an actual honest account of how good or bad we were. And this is because we tend to remember uh, more positive memories than more negative memories. So um, we're, we're kind of filtered that way. This means that when we're making decisions, this can be a real problem because we can go, oh yeah, but when I was a class teacher, I had to do this, this, and this, and I managed all that. So my team can do this, this, and this, and it will be fine because it will just be five more minutes. It always seems to be the answer. And it's just going to take a teacher five minutes to do that. Oh, we've got this new strategy. We're just going to get them to record, you know, uh, what books students are reading at home or what their ambitions are for careers. And it's just somewhere it'll just take five minutes to every teacher that has, you know, a full timetable going, hang on a minute, that's five minutes, you know, per class or per day. It's a huge amount of time when it adds up. But egocentric bias for leaders is a real big problem because we forget how tight for time it is planning, you know, 44 hours a fortnight or whatever people's timetables are as a main as a main scale teacher. Then the second one is obviously confirmation bias. This is quite well understood, I would guess. Uh, people generally like being right. And so when they have a certain opinion, they will look to find evidence that supports that opinion and they'll select that evidence over similar evidence that is to the contrary of them. And then the last one is the called the feature positive effect. Now that one's a little bit more obtuse maybe. Excuse me. Uh, the feature positive effect is Essentially, we pay more attention to things that are there and link those things together instead of things that are not there. So we don't look for what's missing. We don't know what we don't know, essentially. And so when we look at our system and we're building our system, a good example is um, like a behavior system. And we, uh, we're kind of thinking about how we're going to run like our, our um, homework detentions or something in, in our subject area as a kind of secondary based uh, concept, I suppose. Um, and what we're doing is we're saying, okay, so if the student doesn't do the detention, then, then they uh, go to here and they carry on and this is the final consequence. And we tend to look at it, all the things that we have and we see how those things link together. We find it very hard to critically analyze it about and find ways that of the things that are missing. Like what about for students that are absent that day or um, how does that fit in with late detentions that the school system runs or, or things we don't see in front of us, we find hard to make links. So that's really hard for us to use it. And one of the reasons why sometimes we make poor decisions. So unfortunately, so far, I've been a bit doom and gloom. I said we need to know loads of information to make decisions. And we have problems making decisions because our brains don't work very well. And that's totally normal. How do we get around that problem then? Well, it's not easy. You definitely can't get around it on your own. The first thing you've got to do is accept the fact that you are prone to error like everyone else's and you are not the font of all knowledge. And if you accept those two things, then the solution becomes quite apparent. What you need is other people. Okay, and I like to call these people emissaries. So uh, they're maybe not political ones or um, anything like that. But what they do is the same thing. They provide you essentially a different voice. So if I'm uh, trying to make a difficult decision and I'm not quite sure I've got things right or um, there's a lot of potential risk to the decision, then what I'll do is I will go and visit certain people and have a conversation with them about the ideas and float the idea past them. And those may be other middle leaders in other areas of the school. They may be my kind of oldest and most experienced teacher, my young, you know, my least experienced teacher to see how those two different people respond to it and what their thoughts are. They may be my grumpiest teacher who, uh, you know, is the most critical of me. And by hearing those people out, they may point out things that I haven't seen. 
And I may dismiss what they say. I may sort of choose that my, you know, they're not, they're, they're, it's an interesting idea, but it's not quite valid. I don't think it's as important as the, I, you know, what I want to do. But uh, by hearing them out, I am essentially putting in place checks and balances for key decisions. You can't do this for every decision, but for key decisions, policy decisions, yes, yeah, strategy decisions, floating it past a few people is a really, really good way of trying to unpick those biases if you have an open mind to the fact you have them. I know some leaders that um, they open things up for discussion and they get a silent room. And the reason they get a silent room is because every time someone offers them something they're not particularly expecting to hear or wanting to hear, they shut them down straight away. And they, they take it as a personal uh, attack on their credibility and they, and they beat them down. And so everyone else just realizes it's not actually up for discussion and just keeps their mouths shut. And the leader points around going, why are we not having a discussion? You know, this is what we're supposed to do. This is how teams work. Um, and so, you know, when we go out to these ideas, it's really clear that you tell them, you know, this is not set in stone. I'm just having this idea. I'm interested in your thoughts. What do you think? Can you see any gaps in what I've thought about? How do you think uh, people would react to it? Things like that. And just touch base with them at the early stages. And it allows you to kind of point yourself in the right direction. Now, how much time should we invest in a strategy? Let's say a strategy follows this simple kind of curve where at the beginning, you've got to put a lot of effort in and a lot of time and you don't get much impact, but then you kind of hit a sweet spot and then it shoots up and it becomes uh, a really, really good strategy that's only taken a little bit more time. And at the end, trying to get it up to 100% perfect, well, that takes the kind of large slog. So I started thinking about this idea and I started thinking, do all strategies take the same amount of effort to get them to pretty good? And I thought, well, no, <coughs> excuse me. Some strategies are really hard uh, to get the impact out. For example, if you um, applied 50% of a school's behavior policy, that's not gonna cut it, that's not gonna work. You've got chaos uh, maybe in your classroom. Uh, so, you know, maybe kind of a school's behavior strategy, maybe a department's behavior strategy follows this kind of curve where you've got to kind of invest the time and you've got to find the time to make sure everyone's on the same page. Everyone knows how um, the systems of consequences and sanctions work, the way to talk to students. We need to invest a lot of time in that. It's worth it. If we don't, any time we put in is basically wasted. We might as well, well not have it. Conversely, other things you may need to just put a small amount of time in, let's say homework. You know, maybe uh, you can get homework pretty good quite quickly just with a bit of money. You know, maybe there's a system you could buy in that uh, you think does a pretty good job and uh, is easy to track and does it. So you put that in place, you induct everyone, and all of a sudden you're at stage A here and you've got a pretty damn good homework policy. Now, to get it perfect, uh, to get it perfect takes a huge amount of time, but we can get to that point quite easily. And so figuring out how much time we put in on things is really important. The final thing is all about kind of leading others. And a lot of people talk about personality types. Now, in my opinion, I think I did a survey once where I was told what type of dog I was. I think I was a schnauzer. I don't know. Um, but personality types aren't very useful. Uh, and then the kind of business strategy to personality typing people doesn't really work in education. I think schools are too changeable. And what I like to talk about is habits. Yeah, because uh, people do have working habits. You know, some people make deadlines every time. Some people don't. Some people gossip behind each other's backs. Other people uh, just keep themselves themselves. So judging people by their kind of habitual behavior gives you a lot more indication of what kind of team you've got to work with than kind of putting them for any kind of Myers-Briggs, Big Five personality type and go, oh, yeah, you know. Uh, Dominic's neurotic. What a surprise. Well, it doesn't really matter if he's neurotic. It matters is, you know, is he on time? You know, does he produce work to a high standard when he's working with other teachers to plan lessons? They're the kind of things that are really important. So I wouldn't get too caught up personally in their, in their kind of personality situation or any of that kind of uh, business school talk. Now, meetings are everything in my opinion, when it comes to leading others. The thing with meetings is you seem to love meetings a lot more the more senior you become a leader. I mean, I absolutely hated meetings when I was a main scale teacher. They were just, I just saw them as, you know, just 
there for the sake of it. This uh, poster is actually on the wall of our Reaper graphics room for some reason uh, in our school. And I've always thought it's actually, um, uh, you know, quite apt. If you're, if you're right at the top and you haven't had anyone to talk to for now, you can have a meeting and then you'd have someone to talk to. Um, and I think in my experience, a main scale teacher has very much this opinion of meetings. Uh, a senior leader has exactly the opposite opinion of meetings, that meetings are there to kind of bring the team together, to establish a common purpose, to share the vision, to do all the onboarding, to get everyone on the bus, get everyone on the train, whatever analogy you want to use. And kind of middle leaders, I think you need to sit somewhere, surprisingly, in the middle. So my first rule is don't have meetings. If you can avoid them, don't have them. OK, so reasons that people have held meetings that really wind me up. One, if they're trying to tell me something that I have no ability to change. OK, either because I can't inform that decision in the first place because they're going to do what their boss told them anyway, or because I can't change it. And don't have a meeting, just to have a check in with everyone. If you want to check in with everyone, just walk around the corridors and have a chat to everyone, see if they're all right. You don't need to bring everyone into a room and to have those kind of things. So a lot of those meetings that happen are sometimes unnecessary. But you really need to hold a meeting if you want to kind of do some emissary work or get some perspective, or if you need to agree to something that has discretionary effort. Okay, discretionary effort needs that extra time. And it needs people to understand why they're doing it and have a chance to kind of voice their concerns. No, oh, apologies. Um, so when you're having your meeting, one of the things that I think um, is really important is what we call a pre-release. <coughs> uh, pre-release is basically making sure you know what you're going to talk about in your meeting and giving people that information ahead of time. This it can be on a piece of paper, an email, it doesn't really matter how, but you can get them to therefore think about what they want to ask about, come into the meeting, you can quickly go through the finer details, get them to feed back any questions they have, and then either deal with those questions then or get back to them. So instead of having 45 minutes, uh, bringing out all the details and seeing them for the first time, if you get it to them in advance, they have a chance to prepare their responses and they have a chance to kind of give you a considered piece of information instead of just their gut reaction that's full of emotion maybe and depending on what kind of day they've had will change. So having a pre-release is a really, really good way of having an efficient meeting that has um, a focus on one of these two issues. And that's me done, guys. Thank you very much, Adam. Really appreciate that. Um, it's interesting, um, you know, like you said, you focus on some of those issues that, you know, you don't get. I've done lots of leadership training uh, and you're right. You know, there's certain topics that they just don't cover. Uh, and as a, a leader, you have to find your way sometimes. And it's really useful to, you know, get your perspective on it as a, as a leader for, for many years. So thank you for that, for sharing those with us. And you can obviously read more into um, Adam's Adam's story and, and his perspective on things by getting his book uh, if you, you want to learn a bit more about it so thank you for joining us i really appreciate appreciate you joining us on that um there's just a couple of other things obviously you can get adam's book and um, a couple of other books i've read over time uh, which have helped me um in different ways i guess um john Tate, if you're a, um, a head of year he's got a really really good book on certain things you can do as a head of year uh, one of the books I read quite a few years ago was Leverage Leadership. It's an American-based book, um, you know, and it's not always just for middle leaders, but there's some ideas in there that you might find useful and things to think about. Um, another one which I've read is Difficult Conversations. So that was something personally myself I always struggle with as, as a leader is having those conversations. I know Adam said, you know, you shouldn't just leave things. You should always, you know, tackle those things. Um, and it can be quite daunting, especially if you're a new middle leader and you've got a teacher that's got, you know, 30 plus years experience on you and you've got to, you know, speak to that person 
And how you do that is really important, like Adam says. Um, and then just one other thing is not necessarily related to leadership, um, but he's a person that's done a couple of our webinars in the past, Robert Powell. Uh, he's just brought a really good book out for leaders and for teachers. Um, and there's tons and tons of ideas in there for teaching and learning. So that side of um, leadership that, that Adam was talking about as well in improving teaching and learning. And it's all based on evidence, um, which is, you know, the current way of thinking uh, of teaching. Um, so please check those out. There are tons and tons of other books for you to look at as well. Uh, and if you've got any that you've read and you want to suggest them in the chat for other people, then please do that. Um, that'd be brilliant. So as always, we'd like to say a massive thank you to Adam for um, presenting tonight. It was really, really informative and really, really useful. I've, I've made some notes um, that I will use myself. So thank you very much. And I hope it's been useful for everybody else. Um, a massive, massive thank you, as always, again, to Elementary Technology. So they provide us this software. So we're able to do um, these webinars. So huge appreciation to, to all the team there. Also, Crown House Publishing, um, both Elementary Technology and Crown House Publishing have um, been given us prizes to offer on our feedback forums. So we're really grateful to, to both those companies for that. And um, Finch Bakery are offering um, a prize this evening. So this is a bakery um, that's quite local to myself. And there's uh, some twins that set this uh, set up it up small originally, and they've just grown and grown. So you can order um, like cake jars, brownies, all sorts, some amazing cakes, and you can order online. So the website for that is there, and there is an opportunity for you to win um, some fantastic brownies this evening evening and we always do competitions like Avril just mentioned there from companies the last webinar we did um, which was Total Recall um, with Murray Morrison from um, Tassamai we gave away a chocolate hamper and Tarina Lake uh, was lucky enough to win that so well done Tarina um, our famous TNT mugs which are really bright um, so if you don't want to lose your mug they're definitely a mug to have um, Tina Rollinson and Sal Milky won those and then um, Tassamai who um, were at the last webinar talking, the founder, um, we, they gave away some Amazon vouchers as well to Penny Sullivan. So well done to those people from uh, last time. And then one of my favourite bits, Avril, this time. Yep, so with the uh, the feedback competitions, we've got, because um, it's summer, we've got some fantastic prizes. So we've got an ice cream maker um that's uh, been donated by elementary technology so you'll be able to make yourself some little ice creams um we've got the coveted um tnt mugs for you to to make all your teacher colleagues jealous of in the staff room and as discussed earlier the amazing finch bakery have kindly offered to do a blondie and brownie taster box and that can get posted out but that is only for um people in the uk um, because it's, it's getting posted out and it's a food item. So um, it's well worth filling in the feedback uh, form to be in the, within the opportunity to win some of these prizes. And Crown House Publishing have also um, going to give off uh, three copies of um, Adam's book uh, for the Middle Leadership Mastery. So there's some fantastic prizes there, so make sure you fill the forms in. So what, at the end of this webinar, it should automatically open. If it doesn't, I'm going to make sure I put the link in the chat at the end um, so you can do it now and then it's done. Um, and we will announce the winners uh, in a couple of weeks' time on our social media, uh, which is here, our social media. A lot of you already follow us on Facebook in our Facebook group. If not, just type in uh, TNT Teach and Learn on Facebook and we'll come up somewhere. Um, it's a great way to find out what stuff we're doing and, and look what other people are, are commenting on. Our Twitter and our YouTube um, page channel with all our past webinars on there. They're all, they're all free for you to go on and watch them. And um, we've done small little videos as well if you don't want to watch a full webinar with different ideas. Um, all the ideas we do, you know, they're not necessarily things that we, we make ourselves, they're what we've learned over the years and what we've read from fantastic teachers out there like Adam, who's come up with uh, brilliant ideas. Um, and we've got a couple of minutes left. So if there's any questions, uh, that you want to ask Adam while we're here. Um, was there anything you saw in the, the chat, Avril? Um, just having a look now. So something from Ross. Um, 
he just said something he um, I have had one position as a head of department and one issue I found later on was that my tone or intention was to be supportive but didn't come across that way um, and he was not guided by his head until an issue was caused and it suggested the start of the academic year in the first meeting expressing that anything brought up or mentioned is for the best interest of students and department um, so a good thing is to don't take things the wrong way um, is this a good way to go about it and there any other strategies you would recommend Adam so I think that's sometimes people perceive you don't as a leader um, what things you say and do that might not you might not think um, that you're trying to get across yeah no I totally I totally understand where Ross is uh, coming from because um, you know I have had similar situations myself I suppose um, I think it's interesting that, yeah, you can say at the beginning of the year, and I always do, you know, we're all in this together. Um, and my job is to push everyone and we should, we should feel out of our comfort zone sometimes. And that's good. But we, you know, let me know if you feel like it goes too far because, uh, your performance is what matters and you can only perform if you're, you know, relatively, um, happy. I think another thing that's really good here, Ross, is I would challenge that the tone is, one thing that some people can't control like my voice has been described as mildly robotic uh sometimes so uh you know um i've got an annoying southern twang to it um but actions are everything and actions speak louder than words and if your intention is to be supportive and your actions back that up then your team will see that your team will know that um you, it may sound one way but it doesn't matter because it feels a very different way so my advice would be just remind them constantly that you're doing things that you think are in their best interest and make sure your actions back that up as much as possible. I hope that helps. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, just another one. Uh, any advice, I think there's a couple that are similar questions, any advice you would give to the senior leadership team in terms of how to deal with the pressure of Ofsted or maybe as a middle leader, you being in that situation? So when Ofsted yeah, I think, knocking on your door. I think Ofsted is... Uh, is a bit of a bogeyman sometimes, isn't it? I think the one thing as a middle leader that really winds me up is um, when people use Ofsted as the bogeyman for change. So instead of kind of saying, I want to do this, or we're going to do this because of X, Y, Z, they say, oh, Ofsted want us to do this. And I think, in my opinion, that really undermines the entire process because, you know, Ofsted don't really want that much, you know, um, they sometimes get put in a in a bad light and they have been bad before but the current inspection framework seems to be very much collaborative and very much driven by middle leaders and I would say that the one thing the senior leadership team need to do to deal with the pressure of Ofsted is to make sure their middle leaders have the time capacity and facilities to do their jobs well and then when any inspection were to occur as the middle leaders are going to be the one driving it they'll have confidence um, in a uh, kind of uh you know bringing these issues forward and delivering the kind of curriculum conversation they need to deliver and things like that yeah um another one it was quite based on what you were saying about proxies so how would you respond if the school's quality assurance process is based on proxies and how could you avoid that because it's quite difficult isn't it yeah that's really really hard so um i would suggest it you know school policies school policies and you have to follow them I would say this is a, a situation of managing up a little bit uh, where you have to go behind closed doors and have conversations with people that are creating these systems and kind of make them aware of uh, some of the downsides of them in a very tactful way. I would also say that you could adapt it uh, into this is what it looks like in my subject is always a good lever to get change for. So you can say like the classic one is like maths teachers always go, you can't do that in maths and maths we do this. And, uh, and so, um, then you get to change it. It's worth pointing out that I do monitor proxies. Like we have a form and at the top of it, there is a tick list, but the tick list is very much based on the routines that are not to do with the craft of teaching. They're all about entry, exits, kind of nuts and bolts stuff because you want to know those things quickly. So you, you kind of need to do a little bit of both would be my strategy. Yep, thank you. Um, someone said it's, they're a year into teaching have been appointed as a head of, depart, uh, head of year. So quite new to the teaching. The form tutors are all very experienced teachers who have very strong views. How can um, she manage that? 
Yeah, that sounds like a really tough gig, if I'm being perfectly honest with you. Sorry, Saffron. Um, I think uh, form tutors, are, when they're passionate, they've got strong opinions. It's good that they have opinions because it means they're passionate for the job. I would think um, when we're coming to running it as a head of year, one of the things you've got really to support you is the whole school policies and the fact that all years should be consistent. So your other heads of year will be incredibly important for that. But I also think there's something about going into it without a status of I am the, the head of year and going into it more like I am running this year, but we are a, a team and, and spending extra time listening to these strong views and trying to dissociate the kind of content from the emotions. So, you know, they may be saying it in a way that makes them very, uh, come across as very angry or very grumpy about something, but in the kernel there, there might be something that the school is missing. You know, they may just want to get that information across to people because they really care about the students. Yeah, and I think that's important, like you say, speaking to, there might be a really experienced head of years in your school, um, you know, who are really good at the, what they do, and good to get different people's opinions on how they would deal with it, I guess. And then last one, um, someone said thank you, a couple of people have said thank you for the fantastic session, Adam. Um, there's going to be a new head of department in September, and they, they don't know where to start. Um, they're going into school in August to prepare, so what things should they start thinking about as a priority? Um in terms of the first term or year? Uh, yeah, so you need to first of all start off with nuts and bolts. So the department or the, uh, yeah, the department you're running will already have like a, a route through and a scheme of work and things like that. You need to assess that and see if that is what you want and if that makes sense, um, you know, if there's any major issues with it because if that's in place, that's a massive load off your mind. If it's an established team and you're just coming in externally to run it, then you can focus on what should be your number one priority, which is how are people teaching and what your vision for teaching and learning would be in that department. So as long as the nuts and bolts are in place as far as the curriculum, which as it's an established school, we'd hope so. Um, but I, then I would go straight into kind of my vision for teaching and learning, the kind of teaching and learning policy, maybe take the schools and start there and make sure I'm well read and well understood in the areas of kind of evidence informed teaching. Um, and you can contact your local research school if you need to. Um, there's a network of them and they'll support you on things like that. Um, and then, uh, then I would go into assessment, 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 assessment. When are you assessing the students? How are you assessing them? Do you think that's valid? Is it going to give you the information you want? Um, because any changes in assessment are going to have kind of a backwash through the curriculum and everything. So need to be done at the beginning so people kind of know what they're, they're planning for. So they're kind of the big three, I would think. Thank you, Adam. And we've just got another one from Charlie saying thank you uh, so much. Uh, and another one from uh, Carla, who also said thank you. Uh, they absolutely loved it. Um, so that's it. I think we've uh, got through all the questions. And uh, we want to thank everyone for giving up the time this evening, especially in the UK. And it's uh, coming to the end of the term. Or if you're in Scotland, you're already on holiday. Enjoy. Um, again, please, if you've got any further questions you want to ask Adam, then our email is on the screen there. Um, if you also want a certificate for attending tonight, we do do certificates as well. Uh, if you just want to email us on that, that address, um, don't put it on the, the form because we don't always necessarily see it. Please just email us at TNT teaching and learning at gmail.com and we'll get those certificates out to you. Um, maybe the weekend sort of thing. We, like I said, me and Avril are full-time teachers, so uh, we'll try and get them out to you as fast as possible. So thank you, Adam, for joining us this evening. Hopefully the feedback form link is in the chat, so you can go on there and do it this time. I sent it to everybody, everybody this time. Um, and I hope you have a great holiday if you're on holiday in the UK. Um, and we will see you in September for our next webinar, hopefully. So enjoy. And thanks, Adam. Thanks, Avril. Thanks for having me. Take care, everyone. Thanks, everybody. See have a lovely everyone. summer. Enjoy. Bye. Bye. Bye.